Hello, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. There's a few people who are probably still logging on, but I think we can um, we can go ahead and move things along. So thanks for all, all, all of you for joining us today. This is um, a webinar hosted by the Farm and Seed Campus Forum and by the Farm, and, Farm to Institution New England, or FINE as we're called. And it's on local seafood procurement. So we're really excited to dive deep into one of those challenging products that um, often people find hard to source more of when they're trying to aim to increase their local food sourcing. My name is Tanya Taranovsky, and I am the Director of Programs for Farm to Institution New England, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Farm to Institution New England is the backbone organization for a six state network of nonprofit, public and private entities who are all working to mobilize the power of regional institutions to transform our food system. We're working to increase the amount of good local food served in our region's schools, hospitals, colleges, and other institutions. For more information about FINE, please check out our website at farmtoinstitution.org. And the webinar is also hosted by the New England Farm and Seed Campus Network. This is a network that's coordinated by FINE and supported by FINE, and it serves a community of higher education and food system stakeholders who in coordination with FINE are connecting, sharing, and collaborating to develop transparent regional supply chains and to educate campus communities about regional food systems. We've developed this web webinar series to provide an opportunity for anyone to connect, share, and learn about farm to campus issues in New England. However, we also know that a lot of these topics around supply chain issues are ones that affect all institutions. And we hope that we can work cross, um, cross sectors to share best practices and lessons learned. This is a webinar that's been developed by the Supply Chain Working Group of the New England Farm and Seed Campus Network. And the Supply Chain Working Group is open to anyone who's interested in working to transform supply chains to make it easier for institutions, particularly campuses, colleges, and high schools to source more local good food. And these are a few of the different ways that the Supply Chain Working Group is focused on helping to do that. We're looking to develop good models that can help increase the availability and accessibility of local sustainable food, to facilitate coordination and communication between supply chain partners, and also to identify and leverage opportunities where we can aggregate demand to improve sourcing and distribution processes. It's a big challenge, but definitely one that folks are willing to undertake. So if this is something that interests you and you wanna learn more, please let us know. We're happy to have more people join the conversation. So in today's webinar, um, we're going to start with uh, a speaker, Kyle Foley from the Gulf of Maine Re Research Institute. She'll be followed by Maeve McGinnis from the Maine course and Krista Martin and Akisha Haid from Harvard University Dining Services. After each of our speakers, we're going to have a Q and answer set, a question and answer session, excuse me. Um, and we invite you to uh, add in any questions that you may have for our speakers. You can use the chat function to do that or the Q&A. So um, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. We have a great lineup. As I said, we're gonna kick things off with Kyle Foley, who's the Senior Program Manager of the Sustainable Seafood Program at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, which is based in Portland, Maine. Kyle manages the Gulf of Maine Responsibly Harvested Program, which probably a number of folks are familiar with. This engages seafood processors, retailers, and institutions in sourcing seafood that's traceable to the Gulf of Maine region and also meets important criteria around responsible harvest. This collaborative program seeks to empower consumers to buy seafood they can feel good about. Kyle's also on the New England Farm and Seed Campus Network Steering Committee and serves as the co-chair of the Network Supply Chain Development Working Group. Following Kyle, we have Maeve McGinnis, who is the main course director with Sodexo. In this position, she oversees the local food purchasing of all of the food service vendors' business contracts in the state of Maine, including the University of Maine. McGinnis, who's originally from Cape Natick, Maine, and also a current resident of Portland, has a master's degree in environmental policy and sustainability management with specialization in food and the environment from the New School in New York. She sits on the board of the Portland Food Council and the Maine Grain Alliance. 
She has a passion for social justice, local food systems, and the environment, which make her the perfect person to lead this effort to serve more local food at a variety of sites throughout Maine. And then we have two speakers from Harvard University. Since joining HUDS in 1998, Krista Martin has established HUDS as full service marketing and design center, providing all communication support for its 30 plus operations. Krista is a frequent presenter and volunteer with NACUFS. She spearheads HUDS' strategic initiatives, guiding the planning and implementation of work in the areas of sustainability, food donation, business development and planning, customer service, and more. She's a member of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health Nutrition Roundtable. She serves on the Menu of Change University Research Collaborative spearheaded by the Culinary Institute of America and was named a food hero by the City of Cambridge in 2015 for her work on Hudson's food donation program. Chris has worked for several nonprofit associations and has degrees from Boston University and American University in public relations and creative writing. And we have also with us Akisha Haid, who joined Harvard University Dining Services in April 2015 in the role of executive chef for residential dining. Akisha comes to us from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where she served as executive chef since 2011. Prior to that, she worked in food service at other medical facilities and restaurants. She's a graduate of Newberry College. She's, a high, she's highly versed in taking large institutional programs to the next level in food quality, sales, and efficiency. And she's particularly interested in global cuisines and sustainability with a special expertise in seafood. So as you can see, we have a great lineup of folks with a range of different experiences, backgrounds, and positions. And they're here to share with you more about sourcing local seafood in the region. So just a few quick notes on how uh, things work within Zoom. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to participate in a Zoom webinar before, but if not, we have two functions here which you may want to take note of, the chat function and the question and answer function. So if you move your cursor around on your screen, a little bar should pop up at the bottom. You can kind of see it in the image on the left which will offer you opportunities to hit um, a little, a little. there's a little icon with a bubble that says chat. And similarly, there's another one for Q&A. So you can click on either of those. We invite you to go ahead and introduce yourselves to everyone on the webinar through the chat function. So go ahead and just um, hit open the chat, type in your name and where you're from and anything in particular that you're hoping to get out of today's webinar. And then as questions occur to you throughout the presentations, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A section. And whether you do it in the chat or Q&A, we'll try to make sure that we get a chance to answer all of those when we take a moment at the end of the presentations to answer questions. So please make sure you enter them there. We'll take them from, the, um, from those boxes and be able to have the speakers answer them. So without further ado, I'd like to again, turn things over to our first speaker, Kyle Foley. Kyle? Thanks, Tanya. Um, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today to talk about seafood. Um, I spend every day thinking about seafood, so really glad to have you all here interested in learning more. Um, I'm not seeing the slides quite yet, Tanya. Are you, are you ready to go to the next one? Great, thank you. Um, so just in case anybody is not familiar with my organization, we're a nonprofit called the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. We're based, as Tanya said, here in Portland, Maine, but we are a regional organization and our seafood programs are very much regional um, around New England. And as a research institute, um, we, uh, you know, we're doing fisheries and ecosystem research here in the Gulf of Maine region. Um, if you go to the, the next slide, Tanya. Um, but we also have education and community programs. And so our education programs are focused on science and data literacy. And then our community programs where I sit are very much focused on working with uh, people who are working and living in coastal communities and, and dependent on the waterfront for their life, livelihoods. So some of my team members work very directly with the fishing industry and the aquaculture industry. But here on the seafood team, yep, you can go to the next slide, Tanya. Um, here on the seafood team, our mission is really to, to work with the supply chain and our 
our primary goals are to strengthen both the economic and the ecological sustainability of our region's seafood and fishing industry. So that means we'd like to see more healthy local seafood on people's plates, and we'd also like to see fishing communities around this region thriving and not just surviving. Uh, next slide, Tanya. So I'm gonna talk about seafood today and try to set a little bit of context because I think seafood can be uh, something that can confuses people. It can feel difficult to find good and trustworthy information about seafood. And that's in some ways that's just really unfortunate because seafood has this wonderful potential to be a win-win-win um, from a health perspective, from an environmental perspective when it's done right, and from an economic perspective, especially here in our region. Uh, so I'm gonna walk through um, each of those areas just a little bit to set a little bit of context. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to start here by just talking briefly, briefly about some of the health benefits. And I imagine a lot of you in food service are already aware of some of the wonderful health benefits of seafood. Um, but unfortunately here in the US, only one in 10 Americans are eating seafood uh, the recommended two times a week, which comes from the dietary guidelines that we have at the federal level in this country. So that's really uh, pretty bad numbers. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Tanya, um, this also probably comes as no surprise, but we are eating very little seafood compared to how much meat we're eating when the nutritional benefits of seafood really outweigh some of these other animal proteins. Um, that number of about 15 pounds per person per year uh, in the U.S. Um, really hasn't changed all that much. And if you think, when you look at those numbers about, you know, if we just increased that by a couple of pounds per capita um, here in the U.S., that would have a great impact on our personal health. It would also have a really big impact on the seafood industry locally and domestically um, if we were to eat more seafood uh, from this country. Uh, next slide. So I just wanted to share one of the statistics that I always find the most stunning about the benefits of eating seafood. And this came from some research done at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and they found that one to two servings of fish that are rich in omega-3s, which you know we all know omega-3s are good for us, but I don't think everybody knows this statistic, which is that the, you know, eating those rich omega-3 fish um, regularly can reduce your risk of death by heart disease by 36%. Uh, that's pretty amazing. There's not a lot of things that you can do that would reduce that risk so significantly. Um, one of the researchers who led this work has been known to say that the three S's of public health for him are don't smoke, wear your seatbelt, and eat seafood. So just something to consider there about uh, the, really, the really big benefits that we can get here. Uh, next slide, please. And you know, when I um, bring up the health benefits of seafood, people often ask then about the risks um, and, and toxins and what should, we be, what should we be worried about when it comes to eating seafood? Uh, and you can see here this infographic, which comes from the Seafood Nutrition Partnership um, they're an organization with, with some great information and resources on their uh, website. And you can see here the, the top 10 species um, that we consume in the U.S. And then the, the amount of those fish that you would have to eat in a week before you got to an, an unsafe level. Uh, and you can see with the vast majority of the, the species on that list that you would have to be eating enormous volumes of this fish and shellfish to get to any uh, point where you would you would be at a, a risky level. Um, so just something to consider the you know the FDA has in the past few years been changing the way that they talk about seafood because they've realized they've really pushed people away from eating seafood and that's to our detriment largely with the exception of a few species where we have to be a little more careful. Um, so just something to think about um, as you're considering you know what to eat yourself and what to put on menus. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly just about ecological sustainability, which is something that's really important to us here at GMRI. Um, and what I mean by ecological sustainability is really 
thinking about how we are uh, managing our fisheries in terms of regulations and also in terms of fishery science that is informing those regulations. So, you know, you need to know what's happening in the water with different fish populations um, in order to inform good uh, regulations and rules or, or as we call it in fisheries, good management about how much, basically how much fish we can responsibly take out of the water. Uh, next slide. So we in the US have really only started managing our fisheries or, or regulating them in the late 70s, which is um, a pretty brief period of time to have been regulating fisheries. And, and over that time, uh, we've really evolved our fisheries management, especially in the past couple of decades, into a system that is now considered one of the best in the world. And um, most of the fisheries in the U.S. are regulated at the federal level. So you can see on the slide there that once you get past three miles offshore, you're in federal waters. Inside of that, the states have control over those waters from, you know, out to three miles. Um, this uh, image here shows you the regional fishery management councils around the, the country. Um, the, the system that we have in place in the U.S. is a really uh, stakeholder driven and very public uh, system for making policy around fisheries. Um, these councils do a lot of the, the meat of the work of designing fisheries policy on the ground around the country, uh, even though it ultimately has to be approved at the federal level by NOAA. Um, I think it's, it's just interesting to note that it is such a public process. All of these councils are made up of <clears throat> excuse me, made up of stakeholders like fishermen, scientists, regulators, uh, NGOs, and other seafood businesses. Um, and uh, if you go to the, the next slide, Tanya, um, it's a really complex process. There's a lot of different committees and advisory groups and opportunities for, um, for stakeholders to get involved in this public process. It by no means results in perfect management, which is really hard to do. Fisheries science is hard to do, and so is fisheries management. But it is a really rigorous and science-based process that we have here in the US um, and, and in New England. And there are a lot of rules in place, um, especially, uh, as I said, over the past couple of decades, we've really uh, evolved into a strict management system. And fishermen are being regulated around what species they can go out and catch. They have to have permits for different types of fish. Um, they're often regulated around the quantity of fish that they're allowed to harvest, whether that's over the course of a year or a season or um, a day sometimes. Uh, there are a lot of different mechanisms for managing where and when fishermen go out and catch their fish. Uh, there are sometimes seasonal closures in different fisheries. There are sometimes permanent closures, um, or there are permanent closures for different fisheries based on protecting habitat or protecting spawning areas. There are also regulations around how people fish and, and really strict regulations around gear in different types of fisheries and, and making sure that the gear fishermen use is, uh, is responsible and is not resulting in um, you know, damage to the environment or to other, to other species. So, Again, it, it may not be a perfect system, but there are a lot, there's a lot going into this system that tells fishermen what they can and cannot do and how much fish we can take out of the water. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Tanya, um, the science uh, that informs this system is also really rigorous and really difficult to do. Um, and, uh, oh, did you go to the, yep, there we go. Um, so the, we also have these regional science centers around the country um, and they're informing the regional management councils and, and others involved in making regulations um, to make sure that we're taking a precautionary approach and, um, and in, informing that system uh, in a responsible way. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm gonna get into talking a little bit more about the economic sustainability. Uh, you can keep going to the next slide, Tanya. Um, and, and I first just want to set a little bit of context about what our seafood industry looks like in New England, because I think often in, um, in a larger conversation about our food system, seafood is seen as one category. And really in, 
in reality, seafood is many categories here in New England. So the two biggest outliers in our region are lobster and scallops. Lobster is um, huge in Maine and is one of the big outlier industries in the region in terms of value and volume. And scallops really are, are similar based down in mostly New Bedford, Massachusetts, another really huge um, high value, high volume industry in the region. So both of those sectors really compete on a global scale in, their, in the marketplace. Um, but as you can see on this slide, uh, the value in contrast of all of the what we call ground fish, um, so think of the flaky white fish that we get from this region, collectively all of those species had only a $60 million value in all of New England. These are 2016 numbers. Um, compare, compare that to lobster and scallops, it's a, it's a much smaller um, piece of our market, especially compared to what those fisheries um, you know, used to be maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Um, part of the reason for that, if you go to the, the next slide, um, is because we're importing about 90% of the seafood that we eat in this country. Um, and so it's a really big global marketplace and particularly for those white flaky fish, um, are, which easily become lost in the commodity marketplace. It becomes really tough for fishermen in our region to compete in that space on a global level. Um, and even just on a regional level, um, because there's often, uh, you know, cheaper and imported seafood coming in from other parts of the world and in larger regions in other parts of the world. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, often people think, well, that, that can't really be true in New England, right? That we're, you know, we can't be importing 90% of our seafood here in New England. We have such a historic industry here, but unfortunately with the, those white flaky fish, that often is the case. Um, while shellfish, there's a good chance, you know, that that's local, especially with something like lobster or scallops. With those white flaky fish, um, there's a very good chance that the haddock or cod you might find at a fish shack. Um, and this is one of my favorite fish shacks, fish shacks on the screen here, Woodman's in Essex, Massachusetts. There's unfortunately a good chance that at various places like this up and down the coast, um, that their fish might be coming from Norway or Iceland or Alaska or Russia, other places that also harvest cod and haddock. Um, one, uh, if you go to the next slide, Tanya, one of the other things that's a big challenge for our local um, industry is that we as Americans really eat a small number of species. So two thirds of the 15 pounds a year that we are eating is made up of uh, shrimp, salmon, can tuna, and tilapia specifically. Um, so the good news here, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, is that tilapia is a flaky white fish. It's a mild flaky white fish, and we do have a lot of those here in our own backyard. Um, so one of the things that we have done at GMRI with our seafood program is to um, really spread the word around underutilized or underloved species, which are currently very low value for fishermen, but are being responsibly harvested. They, uh, if you go to the next slide, Tanya, they are um, fish that are not being harvested to the full extent that fishermen are responsibly allowed to harvest them. You can see the percentages here of what fishermen caught um, in a year for their quotas. So they're not even catching half, in some cases, not even a quarter of what they're allowed to. Um, and you can see the value there for those five species was about $24 million. Um, if you do the back of the napkin calculation, if they were to get at least a dollar a pound for those species and harvest the full quota, that's over $300 million in value, which really would be a game changer here in our region. Um, if you go to the next slide, Tanya. Um, so we, uh, here at GMRI have been working with processors in the seafood industry, as well as retailers, restaurants, and also institutions for a long time to try to get more local seafood into the marketplace. And I think institutions in particular have so much power uh, to change um, not just what you're purchasing and provide some demand for local fishermen in the immediate, in the short term, you also have an opportunity at institutions of education to uh, teach your students um, new habits around seafood and to introduce them to some of these underutilized fish that we have in abundance here in our waters. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, one of the ways that we do this 
is through our Gulf of Maine Responsibly Harvested program. So this is the eco label you see on the left on the screen there. What this label really means is two things, that the seafood is traceable back to the Gulf of Maine region and that it's responsibly harvested um, and meets certain criteria that we have around sustainability. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, we work primarily with seafood processors to, um, for this program to ensure traceability back to where the fish was harvested in the region. Um, we, through them, we work with institutions. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see some of the institutions that participate in this program around the region. I think we have over 100,000 students around New England who are, who are being served Gulf of Maine responsibly harvested seafood now. Um, so I'll wrap up here. If you go to the next slide, I um, just want to emphasize that I'd be happy to talk with anybody who is interested in sourcing more regional and local seafood and to you know, work out with you what might work for your institution. Um, and just these three things are what I tell institutions, it's what I tell individuals. Um, the things you can do are highlight local seafood, choose a wider variety of seafood, and ask questions. Um, if you go to the next slide, Tang, I'll just uh, finally say that we also hold periodic workshops called Troll to Table. Um, we'll be having some of those in the coming year. Um, they're a great chance to learn more in more depth about what's happening in the fishing and seafood industry today, and we'd uh, be happy to share information about those with anybody. So uh, thank you very much, um, and I think I'm handing it off to Maeve next. Thank you, Kyle. Hi, my name is Maeve McGinnis. I am the main course director. I'll be speaking today about how we've approached introducing more local seafood into our institutions in Maine. You can go to the next slide, please. I will first touch on our commitment with the Gulf of, yeah, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, and then I will discuss the other types of local seafood we menu and purchase. And finally, I'll touch on a few key takeaways from our experience. Next slide, please. Before I jump into the GMRI commitment, I wanted to first outline our definition of local for the main course, including seafood as it varies slightly from land-based products. So for the main course, we define local as main made, any item grown, harvested, or produced within the state. For, we consider local seafood as product caught within the Gulf of Maine, um, which is more of a regional definition due to the nature of fish who don't really abide by land-based state borders. Um, this definition was discussed and is, has the support of the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about the GMRI seafood commitment that we have. Uh, next slide, thank you. In 2015, we made a commitment to shift 100% of our fresh white fish spend to the Gulf of Maine responsibly harvested eco label that Kyle Foley um, just explained in, in great detail in partnership with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, we came to this commitment after several discussions with them on how we could positively impact the local seafood community through our purchasing dollars. Next slide, please. So the species, we have committed to um, the underloved or underutilized species, as Kyle referred to them. Um, on the screen here, you see mackerel, redfish, hake, pollock, and dogfish. While haddock um, and a few other flaky whitefish are part of the, the GMRI eco label, we focus primarily on these underutilized species to build a consist help build a consistent market for fishermen. We worked 
very closely with Maine Shellfish, our regional seafood distributor, and GMRI to ensure that when we made this commitment, we would have access um, to these species consistently for our institutions in Maine. Next slide, please. At the onset of this commitment, we narrowed down on utilizing Cape shark, um, a very underloved species. We worked with the Gulf of Maine responsibly harvested, um, sorry, GMRI. We worked with Maine shellfish, again, our, our seafood distributor and uh, channel fish processor to create what we know under know is the first um, added value product featuring uh, Cape shark, which is also known as dogfish. These are, we call them shark bites. They're essentially a um, fish nugget. The first iteration of this product um, we, we did with a gluten-free breading that was not as successful, um, but we went back to the drawing table, discussed you know, with our partners, and um, after a few other trials, we channel fish processing came up with the buffalo um, shark bites, which had been a great success, um, mu very much improved the quality and um, the acceptability within our dining halls. The other piece of the conversation that also helped the quality is the our ability to speak with the processor and main shellfish um, about you know ways to improve handling and processing of this fish so that the the quality of the meat um, that we were getting was much more usable. Um, and so the open communication was really important throughout this whole process. Next slide, please. Partnership is crucial. We knew when making this commitment that we could not do it alone, that we needed to bring to the table um, those partners that we work with. Um, specifically, you know, Maine Shellfish, we needed to make sure that they were willing and interested in being part of the Gulf of Maine Responsibly Harvested program, which, you know, has its requirements. Um, and specifically, you know, it's traceability. And so thankfully they were very interested in being part of this um, work with us and being part of the responsibly harvested program. Um, working with a larger distributor, you know, because of our demand, we were able, um, now that they are part of the responsibly harvested label, it opens up the market to the rest of their customers as well to increase the, the use of those um, underloved species. Next slide, please. And so internal implementation was important for this um, to work. We introduced a sample menus to our chefs um, at the accounts. We worked on staff engagement and buy-in. Uh, this program was implemented at 11 accounts throughout the state of Maine. Um, some, it was definitely easier to introduce than others. You know, specifically those accounts that have a very strong customer interest in seafood already. Um, it was an easy, shoe in to add more types of species that were flaky and white and good. Um, some of the accounts it was definitely harder because there was just uh, a lack of interest in seafood in general. So um, I'll speak to this a bit more on the next slide, but engagement is a really important piece of that. And so we worked with our chefs and managers to tell them the story of why we made this commitment uh, with wanting to have a positive impact uh, to the fishermen, the community, and the environment here in 
Maine and the Gulf of Maine region. So with that, I'll talk about the other piece of engagement um, on campuses. If you'd go to the next slide, please. So really needing to make sure that if we're menuing um, these products that are unfamiliar to our customers, primarily students and faculty, that we were telling them why we were menuing these. We were really telling that story about that impact that we wanted to have uh, on the fishermen and the community and also the environment. Um, which Kyle Foley had spoke to earlier about their program. And so in order to tell that story, we hold a number of events, um, usually one per semester, and also do a number of other types of engagement pieces, you know, presenting to um, college classes, making sure there's signage and social media telling the story. Um, with the events, some of the most popular ones that we've had so far are the pop-up demos where the chef is out in the middle of the dining hall and um, cooking the, the product and that lure tends to bring in more interest in um, offering them sample size bites of the seafood so they can try it and see if they like it um, so that in the future you know, if they see it on the dining hall menu, they're more likely to try to eat, to take a full portion now that they know that they like it. Uh, so that, the pop-up has been really successful. Shark bite sampling has also been successful um, when we're telling the story about, you know, the dogfish and, um, and how we've worked to help create this product. Next slide, please. So the current results of our commitment, um, several of our accounts have reached 100%. The University of New England reached 100% within the first year and a half of the commitment. So we are super excited to see that. Central Maine Medical Center up in Lewis and Auburn was the second account that reached 100%. And then most recently, the University of Maine Farmington and Machias. Uh, we are currently at, at the statewide level, we are at 71%. Um, this is older data. I'm working on the new data right now, but could not finish it in time for this presentation. Um, next slide, please. So now I'll talk about some of our other local seafood that we um, buy, that we, purchase in addition to our GMRI commitment. Half of our seafood spend is local. 100% of our seafood, seaweed uh, that we buy is local. This spring we participated in the Seaweed Week that was held here throughout Maine. Um, you can see on this slide here a photo of a mint chocolate chip uh, smoothie with kelp that went over very well. Um, so there is some fun engagement trying to tell that story about the importance of seaweed in this um, community. We also purchase um, oysters and salmon and lobsters that are also local. Next slide, please. So some of the key takeaways of making being able to purchase more local seafood um, from our experience is having supply partnerships um, and make and having you know open and honest communication, being able to ask for a product that you're interested in having. Um, maybe they don't carry it at the moment, but if they knew there was a demand for it, they would bring it in. Internal buy-in is definitely a really important piece of um, being able to bring in more local seafood. And then that is linked directly to, um, you know, the continual campus engagement to make sure that you're telling the story and engaging with students on why they're seeing 
you know, some different types of uh, seafood products that maybe they aren't used to or have never seen before and making sure they have opportunities to sample those products and see whether they like them, but also just being able to tell that bigger story of, uh, of the impact that the purchasing choices have on the community. And next slide. Thank you very much. And I will turn it over to Krista and Nikesha. Hi, everybody. I'm Krista from Harvard University Dining Services. So we're going to talk to you about a particular program we have with Red's Best. Um, next slide. But the first thing I would say to you is that um, seafood is huge on our menus. In this past fiscal year, we spent uh, $1.2 million on fish which is more than we spent on beef, pork, and lamb combined. Um, we purchased primarily from two vendors, uh, North Coast and Red's Best. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk to you more about Red's Best, but um, in, at North Coast, 75% of our purchases from North Coast are GMRI, BPA, which is best practices in aquaculture or MS certified, um, all of which are sort of important sustainability certifications to us. Next slide. But in, uh, so, so, you know, I do have to call out that aquaculture is um, vital to us as we're thinking about seafood because um, one of the most popular things that we offer is um, or to, you know, two of the most popular seafoods that 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 people recognize are salmon and shrimp. Um, and for us, the the most sustainable way we can get those is to have them um, farmed, and ideally farmed in our um, region as much as possible. But that it needs to be best practice certified or responsible for us to feel like that's a good um, approach. So, next slide. Um, so I'm specifically gonna talk to you more now about Red's Best. So Red's Best is an entity here uh, based in Boston, right on the harbor. Uh, Red's Best represents day boat fishermen. Um, so rather than it being a company unto itself that goes out fishing, they represent some of the 80 um, fishermen with licenses still fishing out of the, you know, greater Boston area. And we wanted to work with them because that was a great source of local seafood. But the traditional purchasing paradigm of menu driving uh, product didn't work. We would say to them, what do you have for shrimp and they'd come back to us and and couldn't meet our volume or our price or they we'd go to them and say what do you have for you know any version of fish and and that model simply didn't work so what we had to do is think about volume product and price and turn that on its head so next slide please And what we developed with Red Best is a model that takes advantage of um, all the other stuff. So um, there are, you know, eight common seafood that that everybody wants to buy, and demand drives price. Well, we needed something that had good volume, but also a price point that we could cope with. And what that meant for Red Best is identifying the fish that didn't always have the best demand or were very, you know, very variable. And so we came up with a model with them where they would tell us what fish they had caught that week in a, in a volume that was great enough to meet our needs. So when we menu fish, we need about 900 pounds of that fish for a single meal. And they would go to their fishermen and, 
you know, all the most common fish would not be available at 900 pounds at a price point we could handle, but they were catching lots and lots of other fish. And it's those underutilized species, those really abundant fresh fish that we were able to get. And, you know, the added benefit of that is that those fishermen have you know, for lack of a better word, a living wage or a, you know, it's it's um, kind of like fair trade coffee. They're guaranteed a price that remains steady when even when demand is low or demand is high, that price is steady to keep them to, to pay for every fishing trip they take, basically. Next slide. So, what has come out of it is called the catch of the day program. And we're serving red best fish on Wednesdays and Fridays. On Tuesday, they tell us what fish is, is coming in for us the following day. And on Thursday, they tell us what fish is coming in for Friday. And um, that catch of the day program um, it has, has subsequently been spread to hundreds of New England colleges and K-12 schools. Right here in Cambridge alone, the Cambridge Public School is serving those kids the same fish that we're serving to our Harvard students. Next slide. So as I say, we have two menu slots a week. Um, when we initially developed this, we talked about um, uh, we were doing it on Fridays at lunch, and that was very often a good day to do sort of a traditional fish and chips, like a fried fish and chips and, um, and fries. But then we added a second slot based on student demand, um, Wednesdays at dinner. And that fish is a slightly um, higher tier fish uh, that, that um, you know, again, it, it all depends on what is a, being abundantly caught at any given time and what the market, you know, is not paying attention to. So, so we have these two slots for fish. Um, in, in this past year, we bought 25,000 pounds of the tier one fish, 22,000 pounds of the tier two fish. That tier two fish is a slightly higher price point for the fishermen. Um, and it's things like skate, scup, porgy, monkfish, hake, haddock, not the kind of stuff you would necessarily um, find in your grocery store, not the kind of things that are as frequently listed on a menu, but part of what we feel like we're doing is teaching our students how to love fish broadly and recognize a flavor profile that they like and, and that that flavor can come from lots of different fish. Next slide. All right. Keisha will talk a little bit about how we handle it. Hi, everyone. This is Akisha from Harvard University. Um, and I will be talking to you more about how we handle these species, how we cook it, um, and the flavor that we can get from it. So one of the things that we realized is no matter what we do, we need to make sure it has flavor. Um, it looks interesting. Um, and it's something that the students would be willing to try. Um, we started off in initially by having one recipe and whatever fish came in, we would add um, the fish to that recipe. Over time, the students became, I guess, bored and fatigued with the same thing. And as the program grew, we started realizing that all the fish did not suit those recipes. So we started by looking and expanding our recipe banks and saying, okay, we have a four week menu cycle. Let's look at um, different recipes per week, and then we plug the fish into those recipes. Um, as we said, we don't get the varieties um, until the day before, and sometimes we will change our preparation depending on what comes in. Um, sometimes we would get things like um, a yellow fin tuna, which is not usually something that we get, but we would make sure we adapt the recipe to, um, to showcase the quality of fish that we're getting. So that might be a simply prepared grilled with lemon um, and garlic with a little bit of parsley versus something that has a sauce or relish um, on top of it to cover up the fish. Um, so that's talking about menus. Next slide, please. 
Um, one of the things that we um, not only did besides just recipes, which I'll go back to, is getting our students, our staff, our managers, and anyone who wants to hear about our story engaged in understanding that they're real fishermen that go out and catch the fish. They're, um, they're real people behind the stories um, that we talk about. Um, but also there is um, Red's Best, who aggregates all of our fish, that same thing, have real people working there um, and preparing these items. So one of the things that we've found it helpful to our staff or our managers and anyone interested is once they get to see and meet the fishermen um, or get to go to the um, fishery that processes our fish, um, they, it really resonates with them like, wow, this, this is real. Um, the fish is never frozen because it comes in fresh. They are processed and then shipped out the following day. So they realize it's not this big factory with a bunch of ice and freezes that things are closed in. It's really from the boat to the process to be shipped out to us. So we tend to get a lot more buy-in once they see um, the impact that they're having on the environment um, and the fishermen themselves. Um, and then just to go back a little bit on the, the food part of it, one of the things that we also realize is the lack of education um, for our students surrounding the seafood, meaning they don't know the different varieties. They tend to not ask questions about it. And if it looks good, they'll eat it. So our main focus has always been let's try to find fish that the students love um, or applications that they love. One of the things is obviously fried fish. Um, who doesn't like fish and chips? So when we fry our fish, we tend to find the acceptability to be higher. However, trying to balance acceptability and health, we introduce our Wednesday fish, which is usually more of a grilled or baked application that is not consistently fried, where we can experiment with world flavors. Um, and we've also tend to find the acceptability to be higher now because they trust that whatever we do, it's going to taste good. So now they're eating the fish and then asking what it is versus asking what it is and then um, contemplating if to try it. Um, so lunch, um, we tend to get a lot of feedback, um, such as, you know, lunch was excellent today. Thanks for getting some great fish. Um, and like I said, the students now are no longer really concerned about what the species are. They're really just like, oh my God, this is awesome. And I think by that model, we've introduced some of our students to things like, you know, um, swordfish, tuna, monkfish, whiting, mackerel, pollock. One of the feedback that we've gotten previously was, oh my God, the fish has bone. And for a lot of our students, they are so used to eating fish that is filleted, they do not realize that several fish have tiny bones. So um, also education around when you eat um, real food that is not heavily processed, these are things that happen naturally. So um, I think that's all I have, but I'm sure there'll be questions at the end. And one of the questions I just saw online is, what do you do about ordering the rest of the products for lunch? So we have, you know, on our menu where we have these catch of the day slots, we have, you know, everything else essentially planned around it. The recipes for catch of the day rely on ingredients we'll always have in house, like lemons and lemon and capers, or um, a cracker crust, or um, Cajun seasoning. Those are things that are always available, and as such, um, you know, it doesn't matter what fish comes in and what recipe we apply, we have those products. So that's it for us. Thanks everybody. I really appreciate um, having these great speakers on board to talk about their experiences sourcing sustainable seafood. So now we'd like to take questions. We have a few have already come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and direct these to our um, speakers, but welcome for any other additional questions to come in as well. So the first question we have is for Maeve. And the question is, has the Sodexo work in Maine influenced operations of Sodexo in other regions of the US? 
and has it influenced the practices of the food service management sector generally? Maeve, would you go ahead and give that one a go? Sure, thank you, Tanya. Um, I would love to say yes, of course it has. Um, I, I, the, main, the work the main course is doing at a statewide level for purchasing local um, and making local products a priority um, has definitely influenced, you know, places, other Sodexo accounts um, and areas um, in the U.S., you know, California is one example. Um, with the GMRI seafood commitment, I can't say specifically that that has um, influenced uh, any other areas within Sodexo. Um, Sodexo as a whole has a very strict sustainable seafood program and purchasing requirements um, that that all of the accounts have to abide by. And um, I think the last number that I saw was that we were at somewhere at 89% um, sustainable seafood, um, according to a number of outside organizations that helped us come up with metrics for that. Great, thank you. Um, also, we have another question. This one is for the folks at Harvard. And um, the question is, how long did it take Harvard students to transition from what is this to I love it? <laughs> Not very long. Um, I think it, it took us, um, we've been doing the program for a while now, but I think there's always that familiarity. If it's a white fish, they tend to love it right away. Um, the species that are not, um, that come, that have skin on it or bone or shaped a little bit differently or look a little bit differently, such as monk, um, it takes them a few tries or different applications to love it. Um, so I would say definitely by their second semester, they're all about seafood and willing to try pretty much anything. And they definitely eat with their eyes. The first thing, you know, we have signage that identifies what the species is. We talk heavily about who the fishermen are. Um, and those are resources Red provides us every time they bring us a fish. But the biggest thing is they eat with their eyes. And as they come through the line, if that fish looks beautiful, they're less attentive to what the variety is. But I would also add that Google can be your friend or your enemy. So at one point we were trying to serve um, a, a very sustainably um, farmed fish called fly, but fly is a name that's used for multiple versions of fish and not all of them are good. Um, and so the swat, while the fly that we were using met all of our criteria, when you Googled it, it didn't, the story wasn't so great. And it didn't matter how we tried to communicate that story, we, we couldn't convince the students. And so we had to give up on it. So, you know, there, there is where Google can or cannot be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, well, we have just a couple minutes left for questions, um, but as we're taking those last questions, I also just wanna ask folks to take a moment to answer some questions that we have from our poll. It's just a few questions about how you found the webinar today, um, what was most useful, where you heard about it, and anything you might like to hear about in the future. So we appreciate you taking a minute just to answer the poll. In the meantime, folks are doing that there's one more question i'd like to pass on and this can be for both harvard and maine i think and that's a question that says what do you do about plate up do you keep it very flexible and how do you get the rest of the products in time with for your recipes with um, only a 24-hour turnaround it's a great question so i think that's really for harvard because of your relationship with red's best yeah, we're, we're using products that are in-house um, already, and the rest of the menu is built around that. And we've also have um, situations where our chefs, because this program has become so successful that 
would, when something comes in, want to try new recipes and use it as an R&D opportunity, which also expands our um, recipe bank, but also what our students get in terms of flavor profiles. So there's, there's a lot of fun surrounding the program, but also just a lot of mystery, um, but most of all, it's food. So anything that looks and tastes good, we, we are willing to try. Wonderful. Well, I would just like to conclude uh, our webinar by thanking everyone for participating. Thanking, of course, our speakers for sharing the stories. Um, we've got a couple of great examples here of universities who are doing excellent work when it comes to food sourcing. They've shared with us a couple of suppliers that they work with, and those are quite different and kind of result in different programs. But there are other options out there, too, and we hope to continue the conversation with all anyone who's interested in joining it. So there are many ways that those of you listening can join in on this. Uh, we have a number of working groups for the Farm and Seed Campus Network, and you're welcome to join those. There is also a listserv for dining service operators and those who support them. So if this is something you're interested in, it's a great peer-to-peer -peer group. You can ask questions about sourcing, some of the kinds of questions that were coming in today. Um, if you wanna talk about how you communicate with students or other questions that you may have, it's a great way to do that. We also have a number of events coming up. On August 1st, we have a visit to the Yale Farm at Yale University, and we welcome people to participate in that. And of course, we appreciate any ideas that you wanna send us for how we can improve our webinar series, other things you might wanna hear about, or other efforts the Farm and City Campus Network can undertake. So finally, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.